Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the official podcast of the free state of Lieber, where intention is the cornerstone of any project, even when, and especially when, you're building your circle around you. I'm your host, Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for turning up and tuning in. In this episode, I am kicking it with Cynthia Tina, the co-director of the Foundation for Intentional Community. Cynthia has a BA in sustainability and has certifications in both eco-village design and permaculture design. I sat through a presentation that Cynthia gave during a virtual event back in the fall and really enjoyed what she presented and thought during these weird and wild times that it's never been more important to find your crew and build your own resilient future as free and as far away from the grid and the smart cities as possible, even if that distance is only mental. So Cynthia and I are going to get into what intentional communities are and how they function. So if you're looking for a new opportunity, and let's face it, we all should be on some level, pay close attention to this one and hop on the Patreon or the Substack for the full conversation, which begins right about now. Enjoy. Cynthia Tina, welcome to the Kingdom of Ohio and a little place I call Lieber. Thank you for stopping through my neck of the woods. So great to be here, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it is great to have you. So I watched a presentation of yours during this event called the Exit and Build Land Summit a few months back, back in November, maybe. I'm not even sure, but it feels like a long time ago, but it was just a couple months ago. But regardless, I was impressed with you and what it is you're doing around this idea of intentional communities. But before we dig into all of that, you have to tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to this idea in the first place and why you made it your vocation. So lay that groundwork for us, if you please. Sure. So the short version of the story is that I grew up north of Boston in a pretty suburban, urban environment, not in an intentional community. Sometimes people think, oh, you're so passionate about this, you must have grown up in one. And no, I did not. I grew up with a pretty typical American family. And as a child, I had this innate curiosity about nature and was really into gardening, growing my own food, learning self-sufficiency skills, so curious about other cultures. I was a voracious reader, so always reading about faraway places. And, you know, I think as many people, young people, we have this curiosity at an early age, and then something happens in society. And for one reason or the other, we lose this enthusiasm and we're kind of pushed down a little bit by the system. And that happened to me. I remember bringing purple carrots from the farmer's market to lunch at a high school cafeteria and having my friends think I was pretty weird, talking about spending my summers going hiking in the woods bringing my scraps home to compost, and just feeling this loneliness and isolation. And only now, many years later, looking back, I realized that what I was missing is community and a sense of acceptance and belonging and shared values with the people I was spending time with. So I was fortunate enough to visit my first intentional community when I was 15. It was a place called Turtle Island in North Carolina. And this set me off on a whole journey of exploring different ways of living, um, different ways of relating with each other and our places. So I, through lots of other stories and many visits to intentional communities, I've probably visited over a hundred different eco-villages, co-housings, all different forms of intentional communities around the world and have made this my career. I work with an organization called the Foundation for Intentional Communities. It's a 35-year-old nonprofit, and I'm also a matchmaker for people who want to join an intentional community. I help connect them with ones that might be a good fit for them. For sure, yeah, and we'll get into that later too. But I am curious, like, what was it about that first visit when you were 15 years old then that really sort of drew you into the environment or the idea itself and I guess, really influenced you or inspired you to pursue this as a career endeavor? It was incredible to come from a home where we bought all our food at a grocery store. We didn't have any form of real deep connection with place or the land. And then to 
walk into a community where they're growing most of their own food, they're really enlivening traditional Native American ways of living. So I did my first sweat lodge in that community. I learned about scouting. I was so into scouting as a kid, uh, you know, learning how to walk silently through the woods and look at the aminal tracks. And this for me was just really eye opening and also very empowering. Like, oh, wow, I see a different world out there and I see a different version of myself that I can become and forming relationships with people that are on a deeper level, a little more authentic and getting that feedback from my peers that enabled me to grow as a person as well. Well, that is exactly why I asked you to be here to have this conversation. Just that one answer right there just encapsulates, I think, what we're all striving for on some level, what we're all kind of looking for when you just sort of dig through the surface of everything and you really get into the core of yourself, like what are we all missing? And for most of us, I think it is just like a a deeply ingrained sense of community, not just with each other, but with ourselves too, you know, like going back into nature, I think it's a self-development process, right? It ignites this thing inside of you that you never even really knew was there. It's like more primal way of living, this primal instinct that you have. And maybe we could talk more about that later because I don't want to go too far before we get into what this idea actually is and like what it means. Like, so I guess that's the big question is what exactly is an intentional community? It sounds pretty intuitive, but for the sake of conversation here, let's give the fine folks out there the 30,000 foot view of it, the big picture of what that term means and what this idea is really all about. So an intentional community is a group of people who live together or share common facilities and who regularly associate with each other on the basis of explicit common values. That's the official definition that our organization the Foundation for Intentional Community, or FIC, gives. So essentially, it's a group of people who are living near each other and have this fundamental set of values at the core of what they do. It's what brought those original founding members together, and then everyone who joins the community later buys into that shared mission, vision, set of values. And For our purposes, we're mostly talking about residential or place-based communities. You can have online intentional communities. Those are great and wonderful. But we're really talking about places where people live next to each other, where they're neighbors, not necessarily in the same house, uh, in a more neighborhood fashion. Most intentional communities are set up where individuals have their own apartment or home or home in a duplex. and. It's different than, let's say, a retirement community in Florida where people live near each other, but they don't have that same like ownership, common agreements, things that are uniting them in a deeper way. So that's the big view of what an intentional community is. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned the retirement community because I was thinking about this as I was preparing for the conversation. And I felt like on some level, we've been doing this intentional community thing in a more like rudimentary way for a long time, you know, not as, not as like strategic as we're going to be talking about, but, you know, people move into these new places like a retirement community, or they move to like a different school district to put their kids in a specific school, you know, or maybe they move to attend a certain church. I've heard of people doing that or these gated communities and places with like HOAs. So this idea that we're going to be talking about goes much further than that, obviously, like you just talked about, because it's, centered around what I think is a more ecological, more sustainable, more natural way of living, right? Yeah, it can be. I definitely think that living in community is more primal, more connected to the way that we evolved to live as humans. We evolved in these small, close-knit social circles, and it actually is a lot healthier for us as humans to live that way because it's how we're designed. And Right now, most people live with their nuclear family or they live alone. And there's just a lot of loneliness and isolation out there right now. And it has some pretty big health implications. So intentional communities do get at this more social sustainability. I should mention, though, not all of them have an ecological focus. Most do, but you can have intentional communities around all kinds of different topics and ideas. Like you could have an artist community. 
and it's focused just on the arts and celebrating culture together. Well, let's kind of pull some more out of that then, because you know I did a lot of research for this, and I guess I thought it was, from what I was seeing, it was more focused on the idea of sustainability and ecology. But I'm glad that you said that, because I would like to tell people then, you know, more about what kind of social and cultural traits are most common in these communities. Like you mentioned, so they can form around something like an artist community, but are there other, like other specific belief systems? Is it also for people who are looking for just a more natural or more sustainable way to live? Is it a little bit of all of that though? It sounds like. Yeah, each community is different and there's a huge variety of intentional communities. So there's a few common types Eco-village is one type of community under this big umbrella term, and eco-villages tend to be more focused on sustainability, producing their own food or energy, striving towards creating a really regenerative human settlement. So that's one type. Also, there is co-housing communities. That's another common type. And co-housing communities not always have an ecological component. Usually those communities are focused around creating a really healthy social environment. And this is a housing development model that came from Denmark. Two architects, Charles Durrett and Katie McCammett, were studying these co-housing communities in Denmark and brought the model to the U.S. And today I think it's one of the more faster growing models of intentional community and a little bit closer to mainstream living. Then you can have senior intentional communities focused on plus 55, our elders. You can have communes or income sharing communities. That's a really small percentage of communities. And they're usually focused on creating a more egalitarian economic system within the community. So a huge variety. And yeah, I know, like sometimes people hear the term intentional community and they're like, oh, some hippie place off in the woods. But actually, a lot of intentional communities are in the cities. Uh, If you look at the map on IC.org, our website, you can see that there's intentional communities in the countryside, of course, but a lot, a lot in urban centers as well. Yeah, I'm actually glad you mentioned that word commune because I told a friend about this interview and she was like, oh, it sounds like a commune. And I was like, yeah, but no, you know, like it's not that. And the way that she started talking about it just in our conversation there was it made it seem like to her commune carried sort of a negative connotation with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting with that. And then I started I started thinking about this movie Midsommar. Have you have you seen that? No, I haven't. Well, you should check it out. But it takes place. It's kind of like a folk horror movie. It came out in like 2019, I think. It takes place in a community much like the ones we're describing, but it's presented more as like a pagan cult. You know, of course, it you know would be presented like that from Hollywood, right? But it does bring up a good question, just like taking into account how my friends sort of reacted to it, like, oh, it's a commune, and it carried this sort of like negativity with it. How do you address any criticisms or negativity or misrepresentations that may come from people who don't quite comprehend what it is you're trying to do here? Yes, I would say that a lot of people have that misunderstanding and like, oh, intentional community must be a commune or a cult. That's like one whole aspect or association some people have. And then usually on the other side of the spectrum, people think, oh, it must be a gated community, like super expensive Mm -hmm. place where people live and do eco stuff. So we've heard all of it. And I for sure am no stranger to some of these stereotypes, you know, within my own family, I think. My parents sometimes are like, what is our daughter doing? What is she getting involved with? But by and large, intentional communities, when you walk into one, you might not even know that it is an intentional community because it just feels like a really close neighborhood and a way of living that I think we idealize sometimes in America. Like we have our rugged individualism, but we also have these deep sets of values around an old fashioned neighborhood and borrowing eggs from the neighbor and supporting each other when someone's house is burning. And so it brings back some of those concepts and ideas. And there are for sure some really far out there places, some more radical ideas being explored in communities. Our organization does not support cults. Um, We do not support communities where there is 
dogmatic authoritarianism or really control of a human being in any sort of coercive way. These are places that are usually set up to be inclusive, to create a better life for individuals and their families and have some, for them, usually uh, participatory governance structures set up behind them. And they're interesting. They're something to experience by actually going to visit one. I think that's the best way to break some of the myths that people may have about these places. Yeah. Well, let's say that you do want to visit one. What's that process like? I know you can go on your website. You have a map that you can search by, right? But if I actually wanted to show up to a place, <laughs> I don't know if I could just show up. I probably have to schedule something. Take us through that process of, if I do have interest, how do I go about actually making that first visit there? Yeah. Never, ever show up at a community. <laughs> don't just show up. Make sure you call ahead, send an email, make sure that they know you're coming. Most communities, if they are established or have of a larger size, they have a well set up visitor program, certain weekends or times that you can arrange a tour. And some of them even have quite involved uh, visitor programs where you can stay a week and get a whole experience of the community. So the first step is, yeah, going on ic.org, looking at the map, exploring, seeing which one's near you, doing as much research as you can beforehand about the community. Most intentional communities have websites and social media pages. You want to be well informed and not spend too much time asking annoying questions and making sure you're really clear on what is the, the visitor policy for that space especially during our COVID times. So then you reach out and you see if you can set up a time to visit and go about visiting the community. And I can't offer too much advice beyond that because it's so different depending on which community you're going to. And if you're going to a rural community where the expectation is everyone helps out in the gardens, you may want to be prepared for that and bring your work boots. If you're going to visit a more urban community, maybe just bring your camera along and always asking first if you can take photos before clicking the camera. So you mentioned the COVID times here. How have the last two years impacted what you do and the communities that you're trying to serve here and work with? Because, I mean, I've noticed, I'm sure you've noticed too, that like, there's a lot of people on the move looking for new places and new opportunities. You know, some people are leaving certain states to go to other states and, you know, to just try to find better ways to live for themselves. And I would think that, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say what you're doing has seen some increased interest, but I don't know if it has. So I'm, I'm just curious, have you seen any sort of increased interest in what you do just the last couple of years? Yeah, COVID has hugely impacted this movement. Yes, we have seen a lot more interest, a lot more visits to our website, more media coverage. In my personal coaching, matchmaking business, I've seen a lot more clients. And like you say, people who now remote work is a possibility and they can finally move into a community. Now they don't feel comfortable living in their current state and they want to get the heck out of there. You know, all kinds of reasons why people are moving at this time and finally getting ready to set about living in a community as they have dreamed about for a while. So that's been one impact. I would say on the communities themselves, it's been a very stressful time. I mean, none of us were prepared for this to happen. And people joined communities before COVID was a thing. And you join for a community for certain reasons, but then all of a sudden you're faced with this big dilemma. And you need to figure out because you're living in highly communal spaces <laughs> for the most part, how you're going to deal with a pandemic. And some communities have, yeah, really struggled. My community is no exception in that, um, the community where I live here in Vermont. And hopefully if communities have good conflict resolution and communication policies in place, they've been able to work through it and maybe transform the identity of the community or, you know, come out through it on the other side. You mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of loneliness in the world right now. Obviously, the last couple of years have played into that. But even before that, I think it was a problem. And so 
I see that as a benefit, obviously, of seeking out a community is you get more connection, you get more companionship. But beyond that, what would you say some of the key benefits would be for this type of living? Yes. Loneliness is a huge problem. It's not to be understated by any means. I mean, there's a study that came out at the end of 2020 saying that three in five adults feeling lonely, about 61% of American adults. And it has huge health implications, not just only anxiety or depression, but also some really serious heart implications. So having neighbors, having connection and support, being able to open your door and say hello to someone, like just that alone is such a huge benefit. Also the ability to share resources. Not everyone needs to own their own washing machine or lawnmower. There's a lot that we can share when we live together. And that enables us to live more lightly on the land and getting back to, you know, the sustainability values that we spoke about earlier. I had also mentioned being able to grow as a person and how through my community experiences from the earliest days of visiting them, that was one of the big benefits for me. We have this uh, metaphor that I like that's living in community is being surrounded by mirrors, reflecting back to you the good parts of yourself, your growing edges, and giving you that feedback that enables you to grow as a human being. There's another metaphor that living in community is like living in a rock grinder. You're just constantly bouncing off against other people and getting your rough edges smoothed out. So those are some benefits. And then one other one that I think is huge, especially right now, is that intentional communities are these wonderful co-creation or experimentation centers. It's not like living in a community is hunky-dory all the time. I like to think of them as microcosms for all of the bigger problems and challenges in the wider world. Those show up in community too. The opportunity though in community is to sit with our challenges and our differences and not just close the door on someone who doesn't think the same as you, but really try to understand and find common ground. And of course, we're living in quite divisive and polarizing times. And so I think this skill set of being able to work with difference and embrace the other side is of huge value. Whether or not anyone ends up moving to an intentional community, that's something that can be learned from these places. Well, that's what I was trying to get to earlier with that question about, you know, what kind of social and cultural traits are people looking for or like what are they gravitating towards these places for? Because I hope that there aren't communities out there that are like, well, we're only going to take this kind of person. You know, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's probably happened before in the history of this idea. But I would be curious, like, it's because it seems like it is more grounded in whether it's religion or spirituality or the ecology or the sustainability that we're talking about, that it is more grounded in sort of these bigger ideas than just like partisan politics, for example. And I'm curious, though, but (laughs) have you seen any communities ripped apart by just the divisiveness of the last six, eight, ten years? I would say that the older intentional communities and most communities are focused on these bigger ideals. But yes, we are living in very challenging times, and there have been communities that have experienced great difficulty and in some cases fallen apart because of the divisiveness and not being able to come together around some big issues, especially around COVID topics. And then there's some newer communities that are forming around more, I would say, of the times political identities. and some communities that have shifted more one way or the other. And that's like important too, because as much as we talk about inclusivity, it also is important that communities are able to set boundaries and be able to determine who they do and do not want in their community based on what ideals they hold as important. We have to be careful because there is fair housing law as well, and communities need to grapple with that and find a way to work with fair housing law. but. Um, also to find that balance between inclusivity and holding boundaries. 
Yeah, I would think that, as you mentioned, the fair housing law, that would be an interesting line to toe, right? Like in mm -hmm. terms of who you accept and who you don't and the underlying reasons why you may or may not accept them. So we, you mentioned earlier, like a couple of the types of communities. You mentioned eco-villages, you mentioned co-housing. I just want to mention a couple more that sort of caught my eye, but I saw on a list of, I don't know where I saw the list at. It was either in a presentation you gave or on your website somewhere, but tiny house villages are a thing. Yes. And that's been a big sort of trend the last, you know, several years is people looking to downsize because they realize they don't, they don't need all this space, right? And so there's some villages that have sort of popped up around that idea of tiny houses. This other one, which I didn't really know what it was that I wanted to ask you about real quick was transition town movements. I've never heard of that term before. So I was curious what that actually was, because it sounds like you're just taking an existing town and transitioning it to, I guess, fit some sort of intentional community blueprint. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So transition town is a movement that began in the UK with towns that were wanting to transition towards a post-carbon future. So specifically around sustainability, but also community building. And they came out with the Transition Town Handbook, which is an amazing resource, and launched this global movement. There's a Transition Town organization in the United States. They also have a map of these Transition Town hubs. So you can see if there's a Transition Town group in your town. And usually these are very grassroots groups of people who are meeting and doing activities together to help create community where they are. So maybe starting a community garden or initiating a local currency, a time bank program, maybe setting up a free book stall or a tool library. There's a lot of things that can be brought from the intentional community world, many of them, into our existing towns and municipalities to help them transition towards more community. So yeah, this is wonderful and fully support transition town movements. Yeah, maybe I need to talk to my neighbors then. And we've we mentioned that word sustainability a few times now. I think we need to touch on that and what we mean by that, because I hear that word get sort of bandied about in the media. And I hear places like the United Nations and the World Economic Forum talking about it. And I don't trust their vision for a sustainable future. I don't know if we're on the same page there or not, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just curious, like, when you think of the term sustainability, when you talk to people in these communities and, and you hear them talk about that term and their vision for what that future looks like, what do they mean? What do you mean when we say that word sustainability? Yeah, you're asking such good questions. So. Sustainability for me personally is not going far enough. I mean, if you ask someone, how's your marriage? And they say, oh, it's sustainable. Well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, is it, is it, but it might not be good, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we're sustaining something. So I do gravitate more towards words like regenerative or resilient, basically getting at the idea that we live in uh, times that are very destructive, ways of living that are very destructive for the planet and ultimately for us as people trying to live on this planet. And so intentional communities that have sustainability or regeneration or resiliency as a goal are trying to create communities that will be able to last, <laughs> to weather whatever storms may be coming our way. That's that resiliency idea, the ability to bounce back from catastrophe and also regenerate, like restore and heal our landscapes. Many eco-villages have a strong focus on landscape restoration. There's a, one example of a community, uh, Tamara in Portugal, where they have literally regreened the desert over decades of doing water restoration projects, planting giant riparian buffers and food forests, all these things to help to restore our really damaged ecosystems. And I also think that eco-villages have a focus on sustainability in a more holistic way. We may think, oh, the ecology, but we're also talking about sustainability for our cultures and our society, our economic systems. That's why eco-villages, um, some of them, for example, Dancing Rabbit Eco-Village in Missouri, they have their own 
internal currency that they use to try to to keep finances and keep their economy growing. Another great example of that is a community called La Cité Ecologique, means the ecological city in French. And they have so much financial sustainability and regeneration that they are actually employing people from the surrounding region in some of their sustainable businesses. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I have some questions later about the economic approaches to this because I've seen those examples that you just mentioned and I was like, okay, I, we got to talk more about that because when you're talking about a, a community having their own internal currency, my ears perk up and I'm like, uh, tell me more, please. But I want to work some other stuff in here to the first hour. And I think that's actually a good sort of transition talking about sustainability or regeneration. And I think it's a good transition into this topic of permaculture because you have a certificate in permaculture design. And I'd like to touch on that for a moment here. Now, I know that permaculture is all about natural resource management systems. And you mentioned this word holistic. It's a holistic comprehension of the relationship between humans and their environment. So based on your background there, what would you say are the primary principles of permaculture design? And how do they relate back to what we're talking about here with the idea of intentional community? Oh, nice. Permaculture. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with permaculture, there are a wealth of resources and information. And I have taught a little permaculture. I use permaculture principles in my own design projects, my own gardens. It's been a while since I've taken my course, so I won't be able to lay out all of the principles because there are, I think, seven or nine very clear principles in permaculture, like slow and small solutions, stacking resources and functions, things like that. So that is all wonderful. And I can't go into too much detail on that. But I can say in general that permaculture, it's a design mechanism that is based on patterns found in nature. So we're essentially looking at the natural world, seeing how a forest functions, how a forest creates more diversity and health and resilience? And then how can we apply those principles found in nature to our human uh, systems? Landscape, usually, like when we're talking about permaculture, we're talking about landscape management, but also our home systems and even maybe the way we relate to each other. There's this idea of social permaculture too. So for how permaculture relates to intentional communities, I think that it is an incredible opportunity to utilize permaculture in application of a human settlement and being able to apply permaculture in this broader sense, not just looking at, oh, someone's garden, oh, a farm, but really a community level approach to permaculture. And not all intentional communities are into permaculture. Some are. Like I am for sure, and my community is. That's one of the main values that we are founded on. So, for example, my community, Headwaters Eco Village in Vermont, we have a large garden right in the center of the community that everyone lends a hand and grows our food. We have a hoop house, we have an Earthship greenhouse, and many of us try to live more simply and lightly on the land. I'm also using permaculture patterns for the design of my home, which I'm two years into the process of building, as well as a lot of natural building techniques. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, and I, I do have more questions about your home building in the second hour here. Mm. But I wanted to touch on the permaculture because I know it's a popular topic these days, you know, kind of goes along with I guess, like a renewed interest in these more natural ways of living, these more regenerative ways of living that you've seen pop up in the last 10 years. For some reason, it just seems like there's been, and maybe you agree with this, but there's been like a a real sort of like consciousness shift in some people where these old ideas are now new again and popular and exciting, right? And people want to dig into them. And people like me, who I'd never had an interest in this stuff, you know, like even probably just five or seven years ago. So I was in a used bookstore the other day. This is just, you know, kind of goes along with what I'm talking about here. But I'm walking through the bookstore and I see a book by David Holmgren, who's one of the co-originators like, of this concept of permaculture. 
And it's just sitting right there, like in the middle display section of a shelf. And it was like, it was just meant for me, right? It was just there. And so I was like, I just picked it up. I bought it. It was like $4. And I'm just like, okay, I haven't read it yet. So, you know, don't quiz me on the principles either. But I was just, you know, I was like, it's funny how these things just sort of, they open up for you mm-hmm. at a certain point in your life. And you're like, okay, now I want to learn more about that. And you sort of make it known. And then lo and behold, that thing pops up somewhere in your life. And you now have the opportunity to learn more about it. So I don't know where this a ramble came from. I lost my train of thought already. But if you want to add on something to that, please do. Yeah, I would, because I have experienced what you're talking about, especially with books. Somehow when I was younger, just like the next book I needed to bring me on the next step in my journey would just appear. And I remember being, for example, in a shopping mall, just like a shopping mall in the North Shore uh, suburbs of Boston. and there was on the bookshelf of some store, the homesteading handbook, which is this thick, thick book talking about every topic related to homesteading, creating your own sourdough culture, raising chickens for eggs, just all these different topics. And I just gobbled it up. And that was one of many books that really got me into this whole other world and permaculture as well. So yes, and what you said earlier too about old concepts becoming new, because the co-founders of Permaculture, David Holgram and Bill Mollison, they were just borrowing some ideas from the Aboriginal people of Australia and packaging it into this permaculture concept that now many, many people around the world get to learn about and experience. So it's sort of like we're unlearning and relearning and learning again how to live sustainably or regeneratively on this earth. Yeah, it's kind of sad that we need like books to learn how to do that, you know, yeah. that we need like almost like a step by step process of how to like reintegrate with nature and learn how to live and, and function alongside that and as part of it too. For me, I, I wish I would have learned that stuff when I was a kid, you know, that would have been passed down to me just because that's how we'd always been living. I don't want the blueprint manual, you know, but I guess, hey, it's better than nothing, right? And it's better to come across it now than later. So I guess I can't complain too much, but it all happens for a reason. And kind of what we're talking about is timing's important here too. You know, maybe you're not ready for this stuff when you're seven years old, but hey, in your (laughs) thirties, I guess maybe you're ready for it then. So, you know, you also have experience designing eco villages. You actually have a certificate and eco-village design as well. I never knew there was such a thing, but I'm curious what that process is typically like when the dream of a self-sustaining community moves from like just a twinkle in one's eye to the, oh shit, we're doing this. What's this thing going to look like phase? You know. So where do you start when you sit down and go about designing an entire eco-village? It sounds pretty overwhelming. So the course that I took that I got my EcoVillage Design Certificate in is a course through Gaia Education, and they offer these courses in different eco-villages around the world. So you get to study and learn from an established community, and there's a great curriculum. It's also available online. So I've taken that course, and I've been a part of supporting many communities in those early stages. And certainly in the circles I travel in, my work with FIC, I hear a lot of stories from those places. I myself, though, have only uh, failed to create a community once before, just a (laughs) totally different story, trying to create a community in Togo, West Africa. And so I don't have so much experience with actually like what some people might imagine from permaculture design, where you sit down with a map and you just figure out where all the buildings and different places will go. There is some of that in creating an intentional community. That's a very exciting part of the process. But for most people, when they're just getting started with building a community, it's about the people first. And it's about building up relationships, spending time. Like if you're thinking of creating a community with your friends, well, it's one thing to be friends. It's a whole another to be business partners who you're embarking on a huge journey with, uh, usually taking two to seven years to get a community off the ground and also live with these people day in and day out. It's just like a whole another layer of complexity. So 
I often suggest to groups that are getting started to do potlucks together, spend time together before you go about the search process of trying to find a piece of land and then navigating all the hoops and hurdles around fundraising and getting through legal barriers. So that's that's how you actually start the design process. I'm a big believer in people-powered design. There are intentional communities, like a lot of co-housing communities, where they hire out that design process to a property developer or architects who will come up with the dreamscape for a community. I'm really in favor, though, of participatory design processes where the residents themselves determine, based on the unique characteristics of their land, where and how different buildings and walkways and gardens take shape. And I'm also a proponent of building community slowly. I know that there's such a need for community right now and that a lot of communities are just being designed and built as developments. And that's wonderful too. Like, I don't want to poo-poo that. I just think for when you asked about how I would go about designing a community, I really appreciate that the community where I live has been in development for 10 years and slowly bringing in new people And the community where I live, everyone designs and builds their own home. So it just creates this very unique, very like personalized feel to the place. And we don't just draw on a piece of paper where a pathway is going to go. We spend years walking the land and then over time, pathways just sort of emerge based on the natural arc of where someone wants to move on the land. So that's a little bit. This is a very big, you know, eco-village design is a huge (laughs) topic, um, but that's a little taste for how I approach design. Well, the way that you're talking about it, it kind of harkens back to the self-development process, which is never complete. So maybe this community development process models that in some way where it's like, well, we can establish specific things up front, like, because just out of necessity, right? But in terms of the actual development of the community, it's never done. It's Mm -hmm. constantly in development, just like you and I are, you know, just like the people listening to this are. So I hadn't thought about that before we got on the call here. That's a really interesting way to go about it, I think, or to at least think about it when you're sitting down and trying to envision this rather large endeavor and all the hurdles that come along with that, which we can talk more about too. But yeah, I really like that analogy. It's a self-development phase as, as much as it is a collective phase, right? Mm -hmm. So I also want to mention one other incredible resource, which is a book called A Pattern Language. I don't know if you've heard of it before. It's by Christopher Alexander. And he traveled the world visiting traditional villages. He's an architect and studying how they are set up and distilling these concepts into patterns. So the book is It's kind of a dense book, but it's filled with these wonderful patterns to help people design like huge cityscapes all the way down to where to put a window in your house. And so this is a really great resource for people who are building a house, um, designing a neighborhood, whatever it may be, looking to the past wisdom as we've been talking about. This book will help you be able to do that. Yeah, there's this, I forget what the practice is called, but there's this practice I've heard about the last few years where people will go out and they will assess a piece of property based on like the energetics of the land. I don't know if that ties into what we're talking about here, but I don't know how they do it. I forget what it's called. I keep thinking of the term building biology, but that's more about the actual structure itself. But there is this practice I heard people like talking about on a podcast, like probably within the last couple of years. Geomancing? No, I don't think it was geomancing, but it feels like it has some of that concept. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I just, what you were talking about just made me think of like these two guys and I was listening to them and they were just talking about how one guy who was the guest on this show had just went out and this was his job. Like he would go out and he would just assess the sort of energetic value of the location itself the land, like the actual like physical land, the soil, whatever sort of natural landscape was around it. And he would give like a yes or no answer. Like, yes, this is the place. This is the place to build on. And it would just be like, he would even move things slightly over. And if they had 
I guess, acreage to build on. He would just move the idea for where they wanted to build based on the land itself. I thought it was super fascinating. So I might be getting a little in the weeds here because I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so let's go back to um, a question here. We're almost towards the end of the first hour. So let's kind of wrap up the first hour. If somebody is interested in joining one of these communities, what is that process like? You know, because I mean, I assume that there are some differences from place to place, obviously, but just generally speaking, like how would you go about joining one? So I like to equate joining a community to starting a relationship, a romantic partnership, or even a deep friendship, where the first stage is that you go on some dates you, you know, get to know each other. So for a lot of people, the membership process to actually join a community starts when you do an initial visit, you go on an initial date, you see if that works out, see if you like the place or not. Many people before you commit, you know, like make sure you know the landscape and you know what's out there. You learn about yourself, you grow as a person, you figure out, you know, what you do and don't like in community. And I often recommend to people creating a community wish list. I like think about like, okay, what are the top things that I really want in a community? What are my non-negotiables? What do I really not want in the community? And bring that list with you when you shop around and check out these different places. And much like a relationship, it's a two-way street. So you might love a community, but maybe you're not a good fit from their eyes. So you got to find that mutual fit and deepen your courtship to the point where you're ready to commit. So for a lot of communities, that looks like a formal application process. For example, in my community, I spent, oh, six months or so visiting, going to work parties, getting to know the people. And then I decided, okay, I think I know that this is where I want to be. And I submitted an application and was approved. So in my community, once you become a member, you buy your land where you build your house. In other communities, you might just be a renter. You might buy a home. You might build a home. There's a lot of different ways that it could look. But in general, it's that process of deepening into a relationship. It's not the same as applying for a school or applying for a job. Um, you're really wanting to create a connection with the people where you're living. So that's what the on-ramp is like. And with anything, make sure that you know exactly what you're getting into, that agreements are spelled out, written down, crystal clear. You know how you join. You also know how you leave the community. Yeah. Well, that was my next question is if you get into one and you yeah. don't like it, how can you go about leaving then? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, people leave communities all the time for all kinds of different reasons. And most communities have a well-defined exit process. So it can look a variety of different ways, of course. Usually, um, if there's a conflict in the community, there's effort to first resolve the conflict and make sure that relationships are restored, if at all possible. And if you are just wanting to leave for whatever reason, just wanting to move to a different place, it's usually just as simple as moving and selling your home or what other, other property you may have in the community. In our case, we as a community have the first option to buy and the first right of refusal on property so that when someone leaves and we're contemplating a new person coming in, we have a little bit more control over that process. And there can be other stipulations like really each community is unique. So in some communities, you may not get the full return on your investment that you put into your property because they're trying to create an affordable community st setup and avoid kind of that speculative real estate market. It can look a variety of different ways, but I want people to know it is not a cult. You can leave. It's perfectly <laughs> fine to leave. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So before we transition over to the second hour then, which is going to be for patrons only, Tell the free audience where they can find you and keep up with your work and how they can reach out to you, I guess, if they're interested in learning more about this. My website is CynthiaTina.com, and that's where you can learn about my community matchmaking service and also say hello, send me a message. So it's CynthiaTina.com. Tina is actually my last name. I have two first names. 
And then our organization, the Foundation for Intentional Community, with that big map of all the different communities, that's at ic.org, the letters ic.org. I could mention to folks, though, I do have a guidebook, a little ebook that I've written that talks about intentional communities. And it's a great resource if you're getting started with this whole world and movement. And the link for that is ic.org slash starter guide. That'll bring you directly to the guidebook, the PDF. Yeah, but other than that, I think just my website, cynthiatina.com and using ic.org as a resource. Cool. Yeah, we will link all that in the show notes. And so, Cynthia, this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. I really admire what you're doing here and the message that you share with people. And you know, like I said, just we need more connection in this world. And this is, I think, a very, very intentional way to go about it. So thank you so much for taking the time and sharing as much as you did with us. Thank you, Ryan. This was fun. Thank you for the opportunity. And there you have it. My thanks again to Cynthia Tina for the lovely chat and for being such a valuable resource in our fight to be free. And that is where my journey has taken me in the midst of that fight, which seems external in a lot of ways, but is ultimately and exclusively internal. We all have a tendency to bind ourselves to ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of living, and it isn't until we break those chains and unbind ourselves that we're truly free to pursue things in the external world. Because we can't forget that this place is paradise, and it should be enjoyed by living men and living women who've done that work, and who can then live in harmony and community together. And to be honest, when I first heard the concept of an intentional community, I was one of those people who thought it sounded rather cult-like. I mentioned Midsommar during the chat there, and that felt like an intentional community to me in that film. But Hollywood has always loved to shit on people who live off the land and have any sort of spiritual grounding or even mention admiration for the concept of God, they make them look like burdens on society in a lot of ways. Spirituality is always dark and psychotic to them. Have you noticed that? But when I dug more into the ideas and intentions of eco-villages, it's hard to say that people practicing permaculture, building their own houses, growing their own food, tinkering with alternative energies and economies, and living in better alignment with nature are some sort of burden on anyone. If anything, they're a burden on themselves, because that's a lot of work. And what's more, to me, is that it's inherently creative work, or co-creative work. It's learning how to work with nature and with your fellow man to build something beautiful outside of yourself that's also inherently part of you internally. It's the reflection, right? And I keep coming back to that axiom that it takes a village, and the older I get, the truer that becomes. It doesn't take a village to just raise a child, though. It takes a village to raise adults, too. And it takes a village to feed and clothe and shelter them. And it takes a village to make them smile, and laugh, and cry, and feel everything there is to feel here, and experience everything there is to experience. So if that's a cult, sign me the fuck up. Anyway, in the second hour, Cynthia and I talked about her experience building her own home, got into greenhouse design and building science, the shape and space of her house, the idea of circular homes versus rectangular homes and what that means, sacred spaces versus living spaces. We also talked about bringing hard and soft skills to intentional communities, including my skill, which I think has to be storytelling at this point, right? I can also make a pretty good omelet. We also got into root storage and how to grow soil sprouts, growing citrus in a greenhouse, some notable approaches to intentional communities around the world. It's a really wild one in Italy that you should be aware of. We also talked using hydro dams, tree coppicing, and masonry stoves as alternative energy sources gift economies, time banks, and other alternative economic approaches, barriers to entry when forming your own intentional community, how communities are owned legally, conflict resolution, community matchmaking, and Cynthia gave us some, well, I don't know if I would call it relationship advice, but she was, well, she was rather open about her relationship. <laughs> Terrible joke for people who heard that. Anyways, you can check the full episode out on Patreon or Substack if you're interested. $7 a month gets you access to the extra hour plus bonus episodes, like the recent extra with sidereal astrologer Athen Chimenti and my Rudolf Steiner lecture readings and future lecture readings that will be coming as well. And honestly, I really could use some extra support. Times are tough, and it becomes increasingly difficult to invest time and labor into this, especially when so many other irons are in the alchemical fire. And I know there are so many more podcasts out there than there were even just 
gosh, two and a half years ago, I guess, when I stopped doing this, or when I stopped doing the O'Culture Project. And I know they're all asking for support monetarily. So I get it if your own dollars are spread thin and you can't support this. And I get it if you don't want to support it because it's not old culture and you're not really into this. And if you're actually not into this, you're not listening to it anyways. So I guess I'm talking to people who are interested. I guess I'm just hoping that some of you out there who were on the Patreon before or are on the fence about it, you know, especially as we go into spring here and we're trying to plant seeds on what we want the rest of the year to look like, maybe this would be a wise investment. So much love and gratitude to those of you who do support, you know who you are, and it means a lot to me that you're willing to contribute to something that isn't about Nazi demon summoning. I don't know why I keep referencing that. Actually, I do know, but whatever. Anyway, some of those irons I mentioned need to be pulled out of that fire, which means, Ramblers, it's time to get rambling. Until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority. Please rewind this cassette.